the TCS Victory, an outdated carrier forced to take up a greater burden in defense of the Terran Confederation against the predations of the Kilrathi Empire. She could have easily been yet another casualty of a war that had already taken so much, but instead, she would carry the hopes of untold billions of Terrans and be a key part in achieving the end of the Terran Kilrathi War. The year is 2669. Earth and the Terran Confederation has narrowly averted losing the war due to what would come to be termed as the False Armistice Incident. Only through the actions of Rear Admiral Jeffrey Tolwyn, his people, and a last-minute intervention by Hans Kruger and the Landreich Navy did humanity avoid their utter destruction. Attempting to keep themselves in the war, Confederation High Command retasks older carriers such as the Yorktown class from their previous roles in rear guard positions to frontline service. The Admiralty knew that under ideal circumstances, this would be a terrible idea as Kelrathi advances in shipbuilding technology would flat out overpower older TCN ships in a one-on-one -on -one basis. However, the course of the war left them with few options. Given a choice between obsolete ships and no ships at all, well, there was no choice. Among the ranks of the Yorktown class was the Victory, which had the distinction of being the oldest carrier in the fleet still serving, thus earning her the nickname of Tin Can Sally among service members. Assignments to the Victory were generally considered to be not as important or glamorous as, say, being assigned to a Jutland or a Lexington class carrier. Often the officers who were notified of their new assignment couldn't help but wonder if they were being shuffled away onto some backwater carrier as punishment, or if Confed no longer trusted them with more critical positions. Which was the exact situation that Colonel Christopher Maverick Blair found himself in, across from Admiral Tolwyn's desk in his office aboard Torgo Sector Headquarters. He most likely wondered what he had done to earn such an assignment. Arriving on the Victory flight deck, Blair met with her captain, one William Ison, a stern but empathetic man who carried with him the weight of experience, and had served aboard the Victory since he was fresh out of the Academy. Joining Blair on this tour was his friend, Ralga Narhalis, call sign Hobbs. Originally assigned to the Victory's flight wing, unfortunately, being a Kilrathi, no one wanted to fly with him. So Hobbs instead served as part of the Victory's command staff. But a quick word with Ison fixed that, and Ralga would once again fly for Confed with Blair, despite the vocal objections of some. Filling out the rest of the roster was a selection of highly skilled pilots, such as Winston Vagabond Chang, Laurel Cobra Buckley, Mitchell Vaquero Lopez, Robin Flint Peters, Jace Flash Dillon, and in another blast from the past for Blair, Todd Maniac Marshall. The victory in her flight wing would take part in battles across Confederation space, namely being the defense of the Tamayo and Lokanda sectors with Tamayo being where the Victory assisted in the prototype trials of the Excalibur fighter by repelling a Kilrathi invasion force en route to the populated worlds, while the Battle of Lokanda would be where Prince Rakath would unleash his new bioweapon. The Victory pilots fought hard and were able to successfully fend off the attack on all the Lokanda worlds, except for one. The Victory and her battle group would also take the offensive into the Kilrathi-held aerial system to destroy the military garrison base there, while the battle group successfully harassed Kilrathi operations, destroying several capital ships and transports, they were forced to retreat before they could finish their mission. Regardless, this action bolstered Confederation morale as a bright point in a war that had almost been entirely defensive since the Battle of Earth. Back behind Confed lines, Admiral Jeffrey Tolwyn began to set in motion a plan he had been working on for over the past year. And with the Kilrathi's recent use of bioweaponry, High Command had finally given him the green light to proceed. This doomsday plan of Tolwyn's to win the war was none other than the infamous TCS Behemoth. While the details of the Behemoth disaster have been well documented, the general rundown of events is that over the past year or more, Admiral Tolwyn had been transferring hand-picked personnel to a carrier group that he would then call upon when Project Behemoth was given the go-ahead. This carrier, of course, was none other than the victory. The Behemoth herself was a massive superweapon capable of destroying planets, but she needed an elite escort, which was where the victory would take part. The first stage was to bring the behemoth to Loki, where the superweapon would be test-fired on a remote Kilrathi outpost. Upon a successful firing, the battle group would move straight into the Kilross system to annihilate the Kilrathi homeworld itself. But soon after the behemoth successfully destroyed the planet of Loki-6, a Kilrathi fleet had managed to ambush the group as they were preparing to jump to Kilra. Due to the behemoth's rushed construction, 
and a spy implanted into the Victory's crew, the Kilrathi were able to outmaneuver and destroy the Confederation's last hope to win the war, despite the best efforts by the Victory's pilots. But the Terrans were not of the game yet. Another figure from Colonel Blair's past would soon join the Victory, General James Paladin Taggart, and he brought with him one last long-shot plan to win the war, the Temblor Bomb. The Temblor Bomb was a fighter-mounted weapon meant to take advantage of the unstable tectonics of Kilra in order to destroy the planet, if fired on a specific juncture of planetary fault lines. The only problem was the inventor, one Dr. Severin, was held captive in the Alcor system, which of course is where the Victory and her elite pilots would come into play. The subsequent jailbreak of Dr. Severin went by the numbers. The Victory's fighters cleared the way, and the Marines pulled the Doctor out of the Kilrathi's clutches. But not only was the mission successful, it also proved to be a stunning display of wartime performance for the new Excalibur heavy fighters that had just recently entered frontline service. But the victory would be called upon yet again. Once Dr. Severin finished developing his doomsday device, they would be tasked with the testing of the weapon on a planet similar to Kilra on the Hyperion system. Once the test was proven successful, the victory pilots would then lead the operation to Kilra and drop the Temblor bomb on the planet. Led by Christopher Blair and three wingmen, Lancelot Flight penetrated deep into the Kilra system using Excaliburs and Confed's first experimental cloaking devices. While Blair's wingmen were shot down en route, he was able to successfully deliver the T-bomb to the precise location on the Kilra fault line needed to destroy the planet. Afterwards, with their leadership, cultural center, and the bulk of their fleet in Kilra's orbit all destroyed, the Kilrathi survivors were cowed into surrendering to the Confederation in earnest. With the end of the war, the venerable old girl would soon be allowed to rest, but the victory had yet one more task to perform. Her hangar deck would play host to the signing of the Treaty of Torgo, between the Kilrathi Empire and the Terran Confederation, which formalized the cessation of hostilities between the two races, which was a fitting end to a ship with such a long service history. But that wasn't all that was in store for the victory. She would still be decommissioned, but instead of being relegated to a scrapyard or sold to the civilian fleet, the Victory would be converted into a museum ship to tell the story of humanity's darkest hours and the men and women who fought to preserve the light of the Confederation. The TCS Victory, CV-40, was a Yorktown-class light carrier designed and commissioned before the Terran Kilrathi War. While she was able to receive shield and armament upgrades over the years to keep her in fighting condition, the Victory was still considered to not be able to carry the burden of frontline service by the mid to late 2660s, especially when compared to the new Kilrathi Bankara class of carriers. Had it not been for the near disaster that was the false armistice, the Victory would not have been thrust into the role she played, and history would have taken a far different turn for the carrier. But then again, the same could be said for essentially anything else in the Terran Confederation. When it comes to the numbers, the Victory is 720 meters long, with a mass of 28,000 metric tons. Her offensive capability consisted of 11 laser turrets mounted on the top and bottom. As the Victory was a carrier, she was designed for force projection purposes rather than ship-to-ship -ship combat, and carried a complement of either 85 strike craft according to the Wing Commander Bible, or 40 if you wish to go by the Wing Commander 3 novelization. Regardless of the numbers, the Victory's fighter and bomber complement was divided into four fighter squadrons. They are as follows. Red Squadron. Arrows used for point defense of the carrier and the battle group. They would be charged with shooting down bombers, incoming torpedoes, and general clearing of the airspace around the Victory. Blue Squadron. Arrows again, and possibly Hellcats due to the squadron's role in space superiority for long-range patrols and prolonged dogfighting. Green Squadron. The heavy-hitting capital ship killers who flew the longbow bomber. Due to the specialization of the spacecraft, Green Squadron was only used for strikes against large targets. Gold Squadron. Originally consisting of Thunderbolt 7 heavy fighters, Gold Squad were the all-rounders of the Victory Flight Wing, able to engage both fighters and Kilrathi capital ships effectively. Once the Excaliburs entered service near the end of the war, they replaced the Thunderbolts on the squadron. In terms of speed and maneuverability, the Victory's maximum velocity was 120 km per second and an acceleration rating of 10 km per second square, with a maximum yaw, pitch, and roll of 5 degrees per second. Her armor was rated at 1,000 cm on all sides, with her shields at 3,000 cm armor equivalent. 
In all of her known operations in the Epsilon sector, the victory would often be accompanied by two destroyers, the TCS Coventry and the TCS Sheffield, and a single cruiser, the TCS Ajax. This was quite a departure from what we've seen in other Wing Commander games, as there was no officially stated rationale for why the victory ran with such an escort, as the Tiger's Claw often operated alone, and the TCS Concordia was typically paired with a single Gilgamesh-class destroyer, the TCS William Tell. One possible reason could be that other ships were assigned to cover for the victory shortcomings in modern frontline combat. Another possibility could be that due to the importance of keeping their carriers operational, as there were so few of them now, Confed High Command began assigning more escorts for the frontline carriers compared to before the false armistice. Again, as with the Tiger's Claw, I would be remiss if I did not include the most notable members of the crew who helped bring the victory to her place in history. Captain William Ison, Assigned to the victory as a communications officer after his graduation from the Naval Academy, Ison would work his way up through the ranks to eventually become her captain. A pragmatic and stern man who genuinely cared about his crew, he had a special attachment to the victory due to spending so much of his career with her, and as such took pride in the old girl regardless of her reputation in the fleet during the war. After the Kilrothi War, Ison would be reassigned to the TCS Lexington. It's unknown how long he served as her captain, as his investigations into the Confederation's involvement of the Border Worlds Crisis led to his dismissal and eventual defection to the Border Worlds along with Blair, Vagabond, and Maniac. While the Border Worlds Crisis would require a separate video, it's safe to say that the conspiracy surrounding it would not have been unraveled were it not for William Ison. Todd, Maniac, Marshall. Originally, he was assigned to test pilot duties after his declining mental state was witnessed during his tour of duty aboard the Tiger's Claw. While it's unknown how he was transferred back into frontline service as a pilot, it can be assumed that due to the dire state of the war, Confed could not afford to shelve an ace pilot of his skill. Regardless of their disciplinary issues, occasional insubordination, or questions about their stability. But he would join Blair's Lancelot flight to Kilra, ensuring that the Colonel would be able to make it to his target and destroy the planet. He would also be instrumental in helping Blair and Ison prevent a war of the border worlds afterwards. Maniac would also see service aboard the TCS Midway during the Nephilim War. While his mental stability seemed greatly improved since his days on the Tiger's Claw, he never did lose his egotism. Laurel Cobra Buckley A former escaped slave from a conquered Terran world, she would join the Confederation Space Forces to take revenge on any and all Kilrathi who enslaved and killed her family. Out of all the people on the victory, her hatred was so strong that she refused to have any dealings with Raugunnar Hollis, even when the other Terrans began warming up to him. She would be killed trying to stop Raugha as he was attempting to transmit data about the Temblor bomb to the Kilrathi Empire. Her heroic action guaranteed the secrecy of the device and helped prevent Lancelot flight from falling into the same fate as the Behemoth. Winston Vagabond Chang A casual and friendly card-playing pilot, who used his demeanor to mask a dark past about his time in the Confederation Black Ops. Vagabond actually knew Dr. Severin from his previous work, and upon meeting Dr. Death, as he was known back then, proceeded to punch him in the face. After a brief stint in the brig, Blair would select him to join Lancelot flight, where he was shot down en route to Kilra, but he did manage to survive. Blair would meet him again aboard the TCS Lexington in the post-war era, where he would join Blair and Ison in defecting to the border worlds. However, Vagabond was killed during a boarding action to retrieve Confederation communications data, his sacrifice helped safeguard the information that would go on to build a case against Admiral Tolwyn and his actions, in regards to instigating a war between Confed and the Border Worlds. Rauga Hobbs Narhalis, an ex-lord from the Kilrathi Empire, that defected and began flying for the Terran Confederation. However, his defection turned out to be nothing more than a long-term deep cover operation. In order to maintain his cover, Rauga was subjected to a personality overlay that turned Hobbs into a person sympathetic to the Terran cause. But Raugha's original personality would resurface when Thrakath used the phrase Heart of the Tiger in a transmission taunting the victory after their operations in Ariel. The timing could not have been better for the Kilrathi Empire. The newly reactivated Hobbs was able to leak information about the TCS behemoth in her vulnerable areas, guaranteeing that the superweapon would never survive long enough to see its purpose fulfilled. The details of his ultimate fate are mixed, but in either case he died to the gunfire of his one-time friend, Chris Blair. 
Christopher Maverick Blair. Injured during the Battle of Earth, Blair spent the next six months on medical leave. While initially not enthused about his transfer to the Victory, he began to warm up to his assignment after spending time with the crew, who were all skilled and dedicated fighters to the Confederation. He led the flight wing in all major battles in the end stages of the war. The Tamil World's invasion, the Lokanda 4 incident, the Aerial Offensive, the Behemoth disaster, and the last battle of Kilra. After the end of the war, he would try his hand at retiring to become a farmer, but his commission would be reactivated by Admiral Tolwyn as the Border Worlds crisis began to develop. Later on in life, Blair would transfer to the Navy from the Space Forces and become a Commodore overseeing the development of the Midway Project. In retrospect, the Victory herself embodied the Terran Confederation in 2669. Run down, outnumbered, and constantly outpowered by an unrelenting foe on all sides, and yet fueled by an indomitable spirit and unwavering commitment to keep fighting. No longer just another carrier, the Victory had become an icon.